Good morning, and may the peace of Christ be with you today. A City Church is a historically rooted and spiritually diverse Christian community, and we're glad you're joining us today. If this is your first time with us and you'd like to get in touch, please feel free to do so by checking us out on the web at citychurchftl.com slash welcome. Today we're continuing our series called Rooted, and this morning we're gonna be looking at Genesis 2 and what it means to be rooted in faith and work. But before we jump in, hear this call to worship based on Psalm 118. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Pray with me. God, we come to you this morning as our Father, and we come through the work, the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus. Father, we ask that you would send your Spirit among us this morning and draw us into your presence. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.
As we gather together, we have an opportunity to confess together, and we're called into confession with these words from 1 John 2, 1 through 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In the strength of this assurance, let us confess our sins to God. We'll confess together using the prayer written on the screen, and then I'll give you some time to confess silently. You asked for my hands that you might use them for your purpose. I gave them for a moment, then withdrew them, for the work was hard. You asked for my mouth to speak out against injustice. I gave you a whisper that I might not be accused. You asked for my eyes to see the pain of poverty. I closed them, for I did not want to see. You asked for my life that you might work through me. I gave a small part that I might not get too involved. Lord, forgive my calculated efforts to serve you only when it is convenient for me to do so, only in those places where it is safe to do so, and only with those who make it easy to do so. Father, forgive me, renew me, send me out as a usable instrument that I might take seriously the meaning of your cross. Amen. And now, Lord, we ask that you hear us as we confess the way we've sinned against you and against one another. Thank you, Lord, for your Son, for his work on earth was done. On the cross at Calvary, where he hung there on a tree for my sin. The good news of the gospel is this do not weep. See, Jesus has triumphed. With his blood, he has purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. He has made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Well, hey, it's a privilege to introduce this brief video I'd like you to watch. You know, our children, we often talk about them as our future, which obviously they are. Um, but as uh, a church, we believe that our children are, are our present as well. Um, we have an opportunity to watch um, what our kids are doing and the ways that they're leading in generosity as we a city church um, seek to lead in generosity in the weeks and months to come. Take a look at this video. The kids have been learning about our Rooted series in their own way. They've been learning about being generous, what it means to live in unity, what it means to be rooted in the mission of reconciliation and hospitality. So they all got a commitment card where they could say how they were going to commit to being generous and hospitable in their families here at church and in our community. So Northside Elementary is a school that we've partnered with for at least the past eight years here at City Church. And the reason we did that is because they're a school in the heart of Fort Lauderdale uh, that doesn't always have the resources they need. And one of the things we wanted to help our kids focus on is being generous, not only with their time and with their love, but with their possessions too. So we asked them to donate supplies to Northside Elementary, things that the school really needs. So the kids would start to understand what it feels like to take something of theirs, to use it to buy something to give away. Oh, give or away Perfect. I love that. Generosity makes God feel happy because you're helping others. I am giving notebooks and pencils to a kid who I hope who feels happy. Generosity means kind of helping people when when they when they need help with stuff and and loving your neighbor when they're when they're mean to you. I think it's gonna make them feel happy because we're bringing them stuff that they probably don't all have. What we did today is really try to bring the kids in on the vision and mission of our church. We wanna help the kids understand what that means in their own way. You can write a kind note or draw a picture for your neighbor. The best way for parents to teach their kids about generosity is simply by modeling it, by living it out themselves. Kids learn a lot when we sit down and talk to them, but they learn so much more by watching us and seeing what we do. 
One of the reasons we ask kids to donate supplies to Northside is to help them understand what it feels like and why it's so important to have something of yours to open your arms and give it away, not to hoard it and keep it for yourself. Our scripture reading for this morning is found at the beginning of Genesis chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. Well, good morning. Uh, it's been great spending time uh, with you this morning. If you're joining us for the first time, or if you're like me and you need some regular reminders, I want to welcome you to something new for us. City Church is embarking on a new journey, a new season of vision and development in South Florida. You know, we could write down a long list of ways we want to see the goodness of God extended to each of our neighbors, to our neighborhoods, what the New Testament calls fruit. I mean, you can try to imagine a tree uh, and it's bursting with produce. I mean, the obvious but often unseen truth behind a very generous tree bursting with fruit, well, they all have strong roots. Right? The heart of a tree is its root system. Like a royal poinciana, a bottle palm, a mangrove, City Church is going deeper. We're seeking to be rooted. Over the last few weeks, we've been bringing our shovels to church and we're digging around. And as we continue to grow, we hope to cultivate certain qualities, certain values we find deep in the heart of God. Uh, rooted in mission, right? What we do matters. Rooted in, in place, where we are matters. Rooted in unity, who we are together. Uh, last week, we were um, rooted in generosity, how we contribute. Uh, to this thing called the local church and the common good. And today, we are going to talk about something so obvious, so ubiquitous, and yet so often overlooked. Today, we're going to ask the question, what does it mean for City Church South Florida to be rooted in work? Work? You mean like volunteer work for the church? No, no, no. I mean your work your vocational life, your eight plus hours a day, five plus days a week, 320 days per year. I mean, 90,000 hours over several decades. 
one third of your life will very likely be spent doing some form of work with or for somebody. And the question any thoughtful person like yourself might ask along the journey, does any of this matter? I think our view of work affects our value of work and our value of work affects the fruit of our labor, right? The kind of world we're trying to build. Now, for those of us who identify as Christian, or maybe you're mildly curious about Christianity, Christianity, um, you're still exploring. The next vital question I'm asking myself out loud, does my work, my vocational life matter to God? I don't know about your experience. My impressions of work uh, ever since my first job at 16 I was a lifeguard. It was mixed, but generally work for me at that age was seen in, in a few ways. Uh, work was a chore, right? Something you just have to do because as my dad would say, that's just the way the world works, right? Chore sounds like a nice word for curse. Uh, and apparently my daughter feels the same way. Work feels like a chore. Uh, uh, work is also a necessary evil, right? The good stuff of life is maybe before 9 a.m. or after 5 p.m., but we got to survive, right? It's a necessary evil we got to get through. And, and at best, over the course of my young life, I saw work as a means to an end, right? Some greater end. If I could just hit this number, work this long, complete this task, then I can get busy about what matters most to either me or to God. So this is a fairly common, generally low view of work that many of us have felt at one point or another. Okay, well, fast forward. Now I'm 20 years old. Um, at that time in my life, I'm a brand new Christian and I started working directly for local churches, nonprofits. It's sort of an untypical journey for most of us, but my whole outlook on life was just beginning to change and I wanted to know how to think about work differently. As a new Christian, I remember learning that, sure, work was pretty much all of the things that I'd previously believed, but in addition to that, I learned a couple other things as a new Christian. Um, I learned that you need to just work hard because God's always watching and, and you should work hard as if God was your boss. Then, then you're going to be a great worker and, and then everyone will notice how great you are. And, and then secondly, you know, work was for evangelism, right? It, it, it's an opportunity to share or invite or tell your coworkers about like an upcoming church service or something. Uh, be a good worker. Uh, be a good witness. God is watching. And uh, don't forget to tithe. I mean, these were the messages that I picked up pretty early on. Um, fast forward again. I'm now 27 still doing church work and I've opted to go to grad school and just to continue to learn about this, this intersection that fascinates me, that exists between our faith and, and our work. That feeling at the end of a church service, the voice in your head right behind the voice that says, I'm getting really hungry, that says, what on earth does Sunday worship have to do with Monday work? How many of you feel strongly that, I don't know, at certain points in your life, God places people in your path and they end up shaping you in unexpected ways? I had a professor um, at this grad school who became a mentor and a friend, Dr. David Gill. David is an OG, a pioneer of what is now known as the faith and work movement. Uh, David Gill opened up a whole new framework for Christian living, the beginning with our second reading from Genesis 2 today. In the beginning, this is the story of creation, the story of the birthday of the world, as a rabbi once called it. And, and what do we find in these first pages? I mean, look, if, if you and I are meant to find God in ourselves looking back at us from these pages, we notice a couple things I want to point out. Follow the pattern with me here, okay? It says that God had finished the work. Uh, he rested from all his work, from all the work of creating that he had done. The Lord God made the earth and the heavens. There was no one to work the ground 
the Lord God formed a man. The Lord God planted a garden. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The first thing I want you to notice as we skim through this really beautiful passage is that work is good. Work is not, I repeat, not a necessary evil, but an essential good. I could be wrong, but it seems to me that God loves work. You know, fun fact, the Bible doesn't start in Genesis 3. And Genesis 1 and 2 never portrays work as, as a means to an end, but good work well done can be an end in itself. It can be good. Something worth being proud of. Maybe even the roots of a new creation. It was good. You know, the second thing I want you to uh, keep in mind is that we are God's greatest work. If you zoom in at verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Uh, last week, I was meeting with general contractors to go over plans and procedures for this restaurant that we're building out. We had a great time, a great conversation. They love what we're trying to do. At one point, I asked these gentlemen, tell me about a building or a project that you are most proud of. And it was great. I mean, both had great answers pointing toward very impressive projects here in South Florida. You'd be familiar with them. My point is this. If you were to grab God's attention and you were to ask God the same question, what project are you most proud of? The answer is you. One New Testament letter describes the church as God's work of art, his masterpiece, his building. The third thing I want you to see is that your work matters to God. That's the spoiler. Our, our God, the apparent gardener, places our first parents in a garden, not just to appreciate it. God invites humanity into co-creation. God says to his children, let's make something together. Work is so much more than about remuneration. In other words, it's about more than a paycheck. The work of God can be found really in any genuine contribution to the common good. Or the, the teenager taking a little more responsibility at home, the retiree volunteering his or her wealth of experience, and all of us in our vocational journey in between, in every area. You know, the word vocation itself comes from the Latin vocare, which simply means calling. Fascinating. God only and always inviting us into rhythms of good, ordinary, boring, yet beautiful work. Okay, ha hang on. You might have gone this far with me. You're still engaged because you want many of the things that I'm talking about to, to be true and real, but reality starts to set in when you think about Monday morning. <laughs> Genesis 3 is a significant and unfortunate part of the story we need to reckon with, right? That one of the unintended consequences of choosing misplaced priorities and, and disordered love, it affects our world. But not just our world, our industries and our work itself. The point I'm trying to make is, you know, I get it. A Monday morning can feel like a chore, or as the writer of the book of Genesis puts it, like a curse, Suffering and sweat and pain and frustration and stress and inadequacy, insecurities. I know I've felt all of these in the workplace. And God knows. I mean, more than that, as we continue reading the story, as we continue to see the saga unfold, we learn that God not only knows, but God cares. Right? Rather than just demoing the world, or somehow deleting us, starting over, God chooses to get his hands dirty all over again. I mean, we, we look to Jesus, who spent tens of thousands of hours 
learning a trade, supporting his family. Jesus lived fully present into his calling, healing, comforting, and eventually disrupting industries and supply chains and systems that exploit people, his people. We know the story, this level of disruption leads Jesus to a cross, this ancient method of torture and execution, a carpenter hanging on wood. Then buried in a garden, division among those closest to him, it feels like the curse is about to get much worse. And yet, we turn the page and we witness the dawn breaking on the first day of the week. This Jewish carpenter gets up, beating every odd, defeating death itself, breaking open the door that begins to make all things new. We like to say in the church, he is risen. Forgiveness and reconciliation and freedom and power is accessible by faith right now in the God of good work so that it can be applied to your vocare tomorrow, your calling, your work, lesson plans and calendar invites, punch cards, POS systems, contracts, planning events, coaching, retirement, home care, health care, government, technology, the arts, social media, car repairs, and certainly starting a new restaurant, all sacred to God. And we're surprised even further when he chooses our contributions to the world and gives them a permanent place in his kingdom. Look, if I've sparked your interest in a deeper way or a nerve, reach out. Let's talk more. I love thinking about the intersection of our faith and our various workplaces. And in the meantime, I want, you, I want to leave you uh, with this very beautiful uh, modern poem uh, on the relationship between faith and work. The place he gives us to inhabit. The few things he gives us to do in that place. The person he invites us to know there. These our days, our lingering. It is enough then, this old work of hands, his and ours, to love here, to learn his song here. Like crickets that scratch and croon from nooks unseen, carrying on with what they were made for the night craft of unnoticed faces without wings unobserved. And we then, with our stitched white flags, will from behind his evergreens finally unhide ourselves. And with him, we stroll once more. Amen. Let's affirm our faith together with these words from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're grateful to have you join us today. Um, City Church exists uh, well beyond Sunday services. If you want to learn more about the life of our church, the ways that we 
um, benefit our neighborhood, ways for you to get more involved, you can click on this link, which leads you to our website. It's going to have all the information you need for those of you who are uh, active members, ways for you to give on the website as well. Hey, but before you go, don't leave without receiving this benediction, this good word uh, from a God of good work. Um, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>